This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center. This place is different. The Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference. The Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ. Delta Dental of New Jersey, everyone deserves a healthy smile. Johnson & Johnson, Fedway Associates. Adler Aphasia Center, offering therapeutic programming for stroke and brain injury survivors with aphasia. And by Berkeley College. Education prepares us to reach our dreams. Be inspired. Promotional support provided by AM970, The Answer. And by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got, you got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of New York City, Lincoln Center. We have him back. He's Stephen Goldstein. He's the author of a compelling book called The Turn On, How the Powerful Make Us Like Them from Washington to Wall Street to Hollywood. Stephen has been a friend of the show for a long time. Great to see you. Different capacities. By the way, you becoming a rabbi? I am. I am. So I'm a civil rights lawyer, a TV producer, and now I'm in rabbinical school. And halfway few, through. Uh, good luck. Thank you. You By know, I can, I can do this interview in Aramaic if you want. You could. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'd appreciate that on PBS, but let's try to stay focused. Uh, previous life, check out some previous interviews we did with Stephen uh, Garden State Equality uh, and Frank work as well. Here we go. This book, Likeability. What is it? A formula? What is it? Science? Look, let let me tell you how I came up with this book. Steve. Go ahead. I. 25 years ago, I had two very different jobs. Uh, I was a lawyer for Chuck Schumer when he was chair of the U.S. House Judiciary Committee. That job ended on a Friday, and two days later, I was a producer for Oprah Winfrey. Yes, you are. So left brain, right brain. And I started to take notes at both jobs. What makes a compelling witness? And as we tape this, this is the day that um, we have an impeachment hearing. And you could December see- December 4th, the taping report came out. Yeah. We'll see what happens, you, go ahead. You could see which witnesses are likable and not. And so I took notes on what personality traits- The ambassador, very likable. Very likable. I'm just saying. Extremely likable. Not my opinion, I'm just, you know. She, very likable. And then when I went to Oprah, I would take notes on what makes guests likable. Oh, I had about 30 traits in each job. They turned out to be really similar. I boiled them down to eight. That was 25 years ago, and I took notes at jobs ever since. And the premise of my book is that likability can be manufactured by behind-the-scenes people only to an extent. Meaning, if a public figure seeks to be too far from who he or she is in real life, it won't work. They'll be found out. Like Richard Nixon. Um, he was actually a self-insightful man in that he knew he was terribly unlikable. 19, after he loses the campaign in 1962, he's in an interview on PBS. He loses the campaign in, in California for governor. He said, I'm done. I'm, no one's going to turn me into a character. I'm, no one's going to, this is it. Now, nobody says that Richard Nixon was truthful because it was in 1962, <laughs> after he lost the go governor's race, that he right. hired a producer for Jack Parr to make him more likable. So Nixon spent from 62 to 68 actually being coached and coaching himself to become more likable. By the way, Roger Ailes was involved in trying yes. to shape him as well. But the likability thing. Yes. Can we break down some of the characteristics? Sure. Is authenticity one of them? Let me tell you something, Stephen. I bet you'll agree. When I hear a talking head on television say that people want authenticity, I break out into laughter. <laughs> people don't want to watch people on television be authentic. Authentic means we have good moods, we have bad moods. Authentic means we don't talk in sound bites. Authentic means that um, 
we're not attacking another political candidate all the time for the sake of live entertainment to break out of a debate. Oh, and why do we say we want authenticity? Uh, we want faux authenticity. We want, <laughs> we, right? It's oxymoronic. Go we ahead. Want a, we want a version of authenticity. Um, it's the one trait, and I present eight traits of likability, <clears throat> that I say is complicated because we don't want what we think we want. People want escapism. And um, people also have a very short attention span. You know, the first trait in my book is captivation. You have to interest people. In the day and age of 500 cable channels, social people, media, social media, people have the shortest attention span ever. That's how we go from Barack Obama to Donald Trump. So this is a, It's not uh, ideological. We want something new. Hold on. Oh, sorry yeah. for interrupting, Stephen. Yeah. You're saying that Donald Trump, our president, is of this time and likely would not have been able to be elected at a different time? Exactly right. Exactly right. Is he likable or likable by enough? So here's what I say in my book. No secret, I'm a progressive Democrat. So I've I, heard. So I've heard. Um, so you've heard. <laughs> I try to bend over backwards. Donald Trump was likable enough to enough people in 2016 to allegedly win the presidency. And he won the presidency. He won the Electoral College. He did, but well, let's not debate, let's not that. debate okay. that. He did. He did. I, whether he really won those states is another story. So, 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 yeah. so you know, I, I had written several times yeah. and said, not in public television in this capacity because we don't do that, but in some op-ed pieces at some of the other cable networks, I said that I did not think Hillary Clinton was likable by enough people and it was going to be a problem. And the pushback I got was intense. I'm just saying, subjectively, anecdotally, wasn't feeling it. So you were right. I agree with you. I say it in the book, and I was a supporter and delegate for Hillary Clinton. I think people compare Elizabeth Warren to Hillary Clinton um, because they're studious, brilliant women. I think that's uh, unfair to Elizabeth Warren. Now, I saw me, a 60 Minutes yeah. piece about Elizabeth Warren. Check it out. I see it differently, but go ahead. Uh, I see Elizabeth Warren completely different from Hillary Clinton. Um, I think Elizabeth Warren does come across as actually real, more real, authentic. I mean, Elizabeth Warren is a policy wonk. Elizabeth Warren is not trying to round out her edges so obviously. Yes, she does shtick, <clears throat> likeability shtick, like take 90,000 selfies. That's a tool for likeability. But she's comfortable. she seems comfortable with who she is. She is a policy wonk. H Hillary Clinton, whom I love and loved, didn't quite seem comfortable with being the brilliant woman that she is, the policy wonk that she, she is. She didn't embrace it. She didn't embrace it. She was trying to be a softer person. You know what, Hillary? You're the smartest person who ever ran for president of the United States. I think that's pretty awesome. Embrace it. Can I, can I try some other people? Yes. And, and by the way, you've described this likability thing in politics comparable to dating? Yes. Well, ah. So. Let me say this, Steve. Likeability is not being nice. A lot of people, I bet people who have worked for you are asked, is Steve Adobato nice? That's the very- That's the question that's, I hope they don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no. And I tell oh, them- They have an entire like, control yeah. room going, eh, you, <laughs> go ahead, I'm sorry. No, but that, so that's what people think is likable. It's not. Likeability is having a combination of qualities that compels the average person into a relationship with you. Likeability can be strength, it can be toughness. It's what draws people in. Nobody, not even Donald Trump's fans, would say that he's a nice person. He's never- Would they say he's that. empathetic? They would not. You know what, actually, let me, let me, let me correct that. Some might, some might, some, some in his crowds might. Some of his crowds might think he's speaking for us. You or I may not get it, but well, there is a constituency. I'm not projecting views on you, no, right? No, my definition of empathy is a little, it's different than what others might think. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> we, when we go out on a date with somebody, uh, we evaluate them in four stages. Stage one, are they captivating? And are they optimistic? Are they hopeful? Stage two, are they authentic and relatable? Mm. Stage three, are they protective and reliable? 
stage four, are they compassionate and perceptive? Each of those traits are sort of symbiotic. And as we progress from one pair of traits to the fourth, uh, we decide that we like this person, and it goes from dating, perhaps, to marriage. We evaluate public figures the same way. Except, I want to push back a little bit. Yeah. As a student of leadership, writes about it, teaches it, thinks yeah. about it, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Colin Powell once said to me in an interview when I asked him about the definition of leadership in a book I was writing, he said, uh, Steve, sometimes great leaders have to piss people off. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they make tough decisions. Mm -hmm. And some people will not like it. They'll be peeved. They'll talk about them behind their back. They'll be angry about it. But the leader, he or she, must make that tough decision on behalf of the larger good. You're not liked. Leaders, it is my opinion, hard for leaders to be liked by most, if not all, because of the nature of being a leader. You say? I agree with that. And in fact, I write in the book that likability does involve polarization, that meaning it's, it's better to be liked by 50% of the people than be liked by 100% of the people. Because if you're liked by 100% of people, that likability is so not deep. It's so milk toast. I mean, you and I both know people whom probably everyone likes, and you walk away saying, what do they stand for? And, and this, I, this person wouldn't be in a foxhole with me. I wouldn't be in a mm. foxhole with them. So all it means is that you need to have the eight traits to your base. Just like everybody has a political base, people yes. have a likability base. I'm, I'm fascinated by this. And by the way, b before I let you go, your background, and we've talked about this before, it, I have to get this out of the way. How much further along are we, in your view, when it comes to um, back in the 80s? I don't want to go too far back. As a former state legislator, you know uh, my background. I do. Um, <clears throat> and I remember uh, being a part of a movement to anti-discrimination legislation in New Jersey, long story short, uh, barred people from discriminating against those uh, based on sexual orientation for housing and employment. OK, finally passed many years later. How much further along are we? Um, in, this, uh, in terms of discrimination? Not simply acceptance and this thing called tolerance, but the heck with that. Just saying, so, who cares? So, Steve, it depends on the community. Here's what's heartbreaking. Uh, I think my LGBTQ community has made incredible strides. We have a credible candidate for the presidency of the United States. Whether he'll win or not, Pete, Pete Buttigieg. I don't know whether we'll he'll see. win or not, but he's as credible. He's cre as that in and of itself is a big deal. Right. Um, I remember when Shirley Chisholm ran in 1972. Congresswoman she, Chisholm? Yep. She made history, but she was not taken as a serious no, contender. No, she was not. Um, we have not come far in terms of women, the hardest glass ceiling. Uh, I think that LGBTQ people, even people of color who face terrible discrimination, do not face the discrimination women face. And I write about this, and I say, women's likability is analyzed. Men's likability, much less so. The likability yes. of women is a topic. Why isn't it for men? It's a double standard, to say the least. Um, Stephen, I wish we had more time. Can I plug the book again? Please do. Thank you. It's called The Turn On, How the Powerful Make Us Like Them, from Washington to Wall Street to Hollywood. Stephen Goldstein, um, brilliant, thoughtful. Uh, we'll be a rabbi soon. Thanks. All the best, my friend. I appreciate it. Thank Stay you. Stay right there. I'm Steve Adubato. This is One on One. We'll be right back. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We're pleased to be joined by uh, Matt Taibbi, contributing editor, Rolling Stone, the author of Hate, Inc., Why Today's Media Makes Us Despise One Another. Thank you, my friend. How's it going, Steve? I'm doing all right. Do we despise each other? I think we do, increasingly. That's, that's kind of the premise of the book. More than ever? <clears throat> I think we do more than ever. I think some of that is due to, to real differences in politics, but a lot of it has to do with our media habits and the way the media business has, has evolved. And I think that's, that's the problematic part that I'm trying Break to get Break that at. down for us. We were just talking before we got in the air about uh, cable news. I told you we had some folks from CNN, we have folks from MSNBC, Fox, et cetera. Go ahead. Well, in, in, back in the day when we had three networks and really just one or two newspapers in each market, 
the news business was really about trying to get the whole audience, uh, you know, CBS, ABC, NBC, they were trying to get everybody. But with fragmentation, with cable, with the internet, the new business model is to <clears throat> pick a demographic and dominate it. And what we're doing now with stations like Fox and to a lesser extent MSNBC, we're basically pre-selecting news that we know our audiences are gonna like. So we're feeding them something over and over and over again. And what we're getting is two segmented audiences who have two completely different versions of reality. And mostly what they're getting is bad news about the other group. So how does that make us, quote, hate each other more? Because if, you're, if you turn into Republican media, what you're basically getting is a lot of stuff about Democrats and liberals and feminists and that sort of thing. And if you turn on, quote unquote, liberal media, what you're getting is stuff about Trump and Republicans. And it's just the same content all day long. And it's fueling people's anxieties and fears about each other most, most of the time. It's an addictive process. The companies know that this will get people to tune in over and over again. And so they're just feeding them an endless stream of this kind of content. Addictive. It is. It's literally addictive. If you talk to people who are internet researchers, they'll tell you that even the act of pulling a, a phone out of your pocket is an addictive behavior. That's why people are on their phones and reading news content six, seven hours a day. And we're, we're selling ads to it. That's how the business works. So the social media component of this outside of the cable networks, how does it play itself out? Well, if you talk to people who are in that business, who work for the platforms like Facebook and uh, Google and Twitter, what they'll tell you is that when people are scrolling, when they're reading political content, they get a little dopamine rush when they have a, a, a flash of recognition. A chemical of a, in your brain. A chemical in your brain that goes off when you read something negative about a, a group that you dislike. And so that's why, you know, so much political content is it's reinforcing people's ideas and stereotypes they have about some other group. And that's an, it's an enormously successful model uh, mm. commercially, uh, and it's accelerated by the way the Internet works. What part, we had you a while back, and let me ask you something. Is there any part of the Trump presidency, we're, we're doing this at the end of 2019, it'll be seen in 2020, is there any part of this presidency that surprises and or shocks you? I'm a little bit shocked by the, the, the fact that, that this has persisted for this long. When, when I covered Trump's campaign in 2016, did. and I, one of the things I saw as the campaign was going on was that uh, Trump was actually gaining strength because the, the media was actually making so much money covering him. He got a lot of free coverage because even the, the, the negative coverage about him was actually helping him in the end. And I thought that the, the news companies um, would, would see this and, and realize that they, they're doing him a favor by giving him so much coverage. And it, it hasn't been that way. We've actually doubled down on that kind of a process. The companies are making more money than ever, and mm -hmm. it's all Trump all the time. That, that's, that's a little surprising that, that it's gone on this long. Do you see, you and I were talking a little bit about uh, independent podcasts, some of the ones that we like. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I like, and I enjoy doing our podcast, you can go on our website and check it out. <clears throat> you got a podcast? I do. I it's do. Called? It's called Useful Idiots. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Where'd you come up with that name, by the way? Um, well, it's sort of a term of art that's being used for people who are a certain kind of a dissident, and we were, we're, we're sort of joking about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm a certain kind of genius. What am I? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll leave that alone. So the thing about podcasts that fascinates me is I like podcasts when I, where I hear things, experience things that I don't expect. Right. Yeah. It's not predictable. Mm -hmm. You said you believe there's a hunger for that kind of content. I think that's exactly right. I think if you if you turn on Fox or MSNBC now, you know pretty much in advance what their take is going to be on everything. And, I, and as somebody who grew up in the news business where the whole idea was impartiality, that we're just going to report the facts whether you like them or not, um, it's a completely different environment now. I think people have a tremendous hunger for for content where they're going to be surprised, where the person ha is thoughtful, may fall, you know, have one opinion about one thing and one opinion about another thing. Mm. And that's, that's why I think people are turning to people like Joe Rogan or Jimmy Dore, because they want independent voices who are unpredictable, who have, you know, different opinions about things. Now, I think that sort of prefabricated opinion you get on cable news is, is off-putting to a lot of people. Take a step back. You mentioned that you come from a family where journalism is ingrained in it. Uh, not everyone knows. Yeah, my father was a television reporter here in New York. He worked for WCBS. Mike. The, Mike Taibbi, yep. Wrote an incredibly important book. Unholy Alliances, book. yeah. About, uh, well. It's what a, a story. What a, what a story. Yeah. What a powerful, 
powerful story. Yeah, and my father was, a, he's, a, he's an old school news person, you know, the stories of the boss. Um, you would give them the facts whether people liked it or not. He didn't sit there and go, here's my point of view, right. and I'm going to get it out there. In fact, he's very proud of the fact that in his entire career, he only wrote like two editorials. He was just not that kind of a person. Obviously, I took a different path in, yes. in journalism, but, but that kind of uh, reporting has kind of gone out of style now because everybody has you know, a, a Twitter handle now. Basically, all reporters are editorialists, and it's very tough to not have a point of view in the news anymore, and that sort of that form of reporting has really just gone out of style. By the way, where's social media in your life? Um, and that, um, you know, on Twitter, at M. Taibbi. Uh, but that's pretty much it. I, you know, I don't really, uh, apart from the podcast, which is on YouTube and, uh, and on Apple as well. Let's break down, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're talking about the 2020 presidential election. This is risky because we're doing this at the end of right. 2019. We're not engaged in prognostication, but I am interested in the bigger picture of this race. So as we do this program, uh, Kamala Harris has dropped out. There'll be other Democrats who will drop out. Uh, Mike Bloomberg, as we do this program, right. has jumped in. Mm -hmm. So this program is seen in April, March, April. <laughs> what are we going to see? Well, That's not the first time it'll be seen, but if it's repeated then, what do you believe will be the landscape? Well, by March, April, we should have a pretty fair idea of who the nominee on the Democratic side that? is going to be. I mean, pretty much by Super Tuesday, usually it's fairly clear. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a, an extremely unusual race. I mean, we've had, with Bloomberg's entrance, he's the 29th person to enter the race on the Democratic side, which is an unbelievable amount compared to even, the, I think it was 17 on the Republican side last time. Is that why you call it a clown car disaster? I, I did, yeah, we called it, we, it was a clown car last time, but this is the same thing. I mean, it's ridiculous, it's very difficult. I'm, you know, I'm covering this for Rolling Stone and people have a very difficult time sorting out this many candidates. They don't know what to make of it. And um, there will be some more clarity soon, but uh, it's gonna be a crazy race, uh, no matter what happens. So let me try this. Again, we don't know what's gonna happen with Joe Biden. Um, and it doesn't matter in the context of this question. To what degree do you think Joe Biden, um, and I'm, it's interesting because he's running for president multiple times. Mm -hmm. Started as a very young man. Yep, 1988. Mm -hmm. you think about that, mm -hmm. right? To what extent do you think he's judged by a different standard because Donald Trump is the president? Oh, I think that's absolutely true. I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a previous incarnation in 2004 or 2000, the campaign that he's run with all of the, he's, he's had so many moments of, I would say, verbal indiscretion where he said something that in a previous campaign would have probably been disqualifying. Um, but it, because the ostensible opponent is Donald Trump, voters, I and mean, they'll say this, things like this to me, they'll say, well, you know, I'll still take him over Donald Trump. And so uh, he, his campaign is being judged, especially by reporters, you know, who are kind of letting a lot of things slide that they wouldn't otherwise. Um, but his campaign, is his staying power as front runner, I think is the, the biggest underreported story of this campaign season. It's been kind of amazing. Uh, he's persisted in the lead despite, you know, a campaign that hasn't been terribly well run. And, and I think that's, that's an, uh, an amazing story. We'll see where, where we are, as I said, in March and April. But I'm curious about this. Um, and again, here at Public Television, we do not have a point of view. It's not right. our job. Our job is to have meaningful mm -hmm. dialogue. That being said, uh, Donald Trump's in a very strong position politically. That's not commentary. It's just when you have mm -hmm. a, a block of support that's as solid as his block of support, that at least to date as we do this program entering 2020, doesn't appear to be changing very much. Why is that a tremendous advantage, even if that's not at 50 percent in a general election? Well, there's a couple of things going on. Historically, incumbents who have 85 to 90 percent of the support within their own party do tremendously well. They very seldom lose. He, Trump is more or less at that level. He has the same kind of support that, for instance, George W. Bush had in 2004. Um, and secondarily, Trump in 2016 was a very unusual candidate. He, uh, one in five voters uh, in 2016 disapproved of both candidates, but of those voters, 
Uh, Trump had an enormous advantage. So he, one of his biggest constituencies was people who actually disapproved of him. So Did having, they dislike Hillary Clinton even they, more? They disliked Clinton more, yeah. And that was one of the reasons why people like me, I thought Trump had no chance. You did not think he had a chance? Well, I thought he, had a, I thought he was a lock to win the nomination. I was actually one of the first people to say that, but I was completely fooled about his chances in the general election, like a lot of people. Did you not realize how weak she would be with some? I, I, you know, I, I should have known better. You know, I let pollsters talk me out of it. I, it was a real <laughs> educational moment for me as a campaign reporter. I listened to people who tell me that it was impossible mathematically. And they're still, they're still saying things like that. And I think it's incumbent upon people like, you know, who have the, the job that I have to ignore that and, and you know, think realistically about what, what's going on. And tr you're right, Trump is in a strong position relatively. I think it's going to be close no matter what happens. A few seconds left. This election, 2020, regardless of who wins, mm -hmm. I know every election is important. This, this is incredibly important. I would say it's incredibly important, absolutely. I, this is the most contentious political environment that we've had in a generation, probably dating back to 1968. Um, if if the race is very, very close, there are going to be claims of illegitimacy on the other side, no matter what happens. And right. so I think this, this is an incredibly important election. It's important to make sure that it's run fairly. We'll continue to follow your reporting, The Rolling Stone, and your podcast again is? Useful Idiots. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks very much, Steve. I'm Steve Adubato. This is One-on-One. Uh, -on -one. Catch us next time. One-on-One -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center, the Russell Berry Foundation, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Johnson & Johnson, Fedway Associates, Adler Aphasia Center, and by Berkeley College. Promotional support provided by AM970, The Answer, and by NJ.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Dennis Wilson, President and CEO of Delta Dental of New Jersey. You probably know that visiting your dentist and daily at-home care are necessary for maintaining good oral health. What you might not know is that your oral health is connected to your overall health. Oral health may impact conditions like diabetes, blood disorders, and heart disease. Regular cleanings and checkups allow your dentist to assess your risk and keep you and your smile healthy.